this morning I'm going to share with you a little bit about how what it's like to taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? How many know that verse out of Psalm 34? Um, when I first read that, I, I thought to myself, that's interesting. And then, of course, my mind starts to wander. And uh, it, it wandered into the idea that there must be something to um, taste and see that the Lord is good. And we'll get into that in a minute. But first, I want to introduce to you my ministry team, which is my family. And we could put, there we are, the Empies and the McEvenues is my uh, two daughters, Felicia and Julia. Felicia standing with her husband behind her, behind her, that's Michael. And the other daughter is Julia. She's doing her Ph.D. at, at Laurier. And in uh, and, and both their, their hands is Dolly and, and, and Joey. They are the two evangelists of the family. You say, how can dogs be evangelists? I'm telling you, you get dogs and you start walking. You, you want to meet people in your area? You walk dogs and you will meet people. Honestly, uh, we, when we moved into our new building, we hardly knew anybody. But through walking the dogs, because you got to go out two or three times a day, and people, have, well, their dogs are going out. And so you meet them, and that's how you get to know. And you talk, oh, those are, what kind of dogs are those? Those are schnauzers. What's a schnauzer? It sounds like you're sneezing or something, but they're wonderful evangelists, and you get to meet people and get to talk to them and get to know them, and through the dogs, we evangelize our neighbors. And how many know that your neighbors, your family, neighbors, and friends need to taste and see that the Lord is good, amen? How many of them need, all of them need to do that, and, and this is what we talk about. So let's go to our first uh, slide after the, that one. Well, this is what... We can taste and see that the Lord is good. Ooh, cherries. Now, I know we're past the season, but remember just a few months ago, the cherries from Niagara, you'd bite into them and they'd snap as you bit into them because they were so fresh. And all oh, the juice was just, oh my goodness, amazing. And then cherries comes, after cherries comes what? Oh, strawberries. You know those big ones that grow on the vine? They're not picked somewhere green in California or somewhere else. And they're like from the farms locally, and they're just, you can taste the strawberry in them. Amen? Oh, and how else can we taste and see the Lord is good? Next, please. Watermelon. Now, I mean, you know, see, this, this, is, this is old school. This has got seeds in it, because now I know, you don't even know that watermelons have seeds anymore. But when I was a kid growing up, seeds were important. Seeds were important because that's how you decided who was the best seed spitter in your class. So you, you would start off learning how to spit, and you got to kind of put them in your tongue, and you got to roll your tongue up and whoosh them out, you know? But then, but then, of course, your mother would tell you, don't swallow the seeds, don't swallow the seeds, because they'll get inside you, and they'll start to grow. And, and uh, where do they get this stuff from, you know? But, but so I'm waking up, and I'm like, I feel something move my stomach. It's growing. It's going to come out my nose. It's going to come out my ears. Oh, no. I swallow the seeds. Forgive me. But, oh, man, is that watermelon good, eh? Next. And then, of course, there's good old fruit salads. Look at the kiwi and, and the blueberries and, oh, my, pineapple or peanut, as we call it in Cuba. Unbelievable. And now we're getting out of the fruit season. We're getting into the fall. And what do we have to go for? Oh, we're getting into, oh, cheesecake. What time are we breaking for lunch, Pastor? <laughs> Next. Oh, pizza. Look at the cheese on that baby. I'm telling you. That's a heart stopper right there, that pizza is. Next. And last but not least, barbecue. I mean, we, we moved into a new building, and one of the prerequisites was that we'd be able to continue to barbecue because most buildings are hermetically sealed or two that they got rules, rules, rules. We got into an old building and guess what? We can barbecue on our balcony. So we barbecue all year round now and man, there is nothing like barbecue, eh? It's got a flavor to it. You cannot reproduce in a pan or in a pot. Oh my goodness. So you see, all those are examples of how we can taste and see that the Lord is good. That's called the general revelation, okay? Just like you can see the finger of God in the skies and in the mountains and all the beautiful things, that's the general revelation of God. I remember I was skiing at Lake Louise one time, and I was at the very top of the mountain where the downhill begins, 
and I was looking out over Lake Louise, and it was emerald green, and the seven sisters were covered in white snow, and there was the chateau of Lake Louise with the smoke coming out of the chimneys. It was absolutely perfect. And I said to the Lord, it doesn't get any better than this. And you know what he said to me? He said, Gary, you see through a glass darkly. In other words, if you think this is something, you ain't seen nothing yet till you see the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven and the place that God has built to prepare a place for all of us. All of you, every single one of you has a place in that new Jerusalem. And that's where we'll be with the Lord for the millennial kingdom. Amen? I mean, it's just going to be... I mean, here's what's interesting about it. The thing that we value so much, like gold, gold, the price of gold and the value of gold. You know what God does with gold? He paves the streets with it. You know, walk on it. That's how important it is in God's kingdom. It ain't worth nothing. Pave the streets with gold. So, here we are looking at that general revelation that we see all around us all the time. And then through the food and all the wonderful gifts that God has given to us, we can taste and see that the Lord is good. It smells so good, it looks so good, it makes us hungry. But we live in a hungry world, a world that's empty and void inside, it, that place inside of every human being that yearns to be filled. And so they fill it. They fill it with things like houses and cars and food and spouses and careers. But you know what? They're still hungry. You know, my own story was I was hungry. I, I didn't look so much for material things because I was raised with material things. We had lots of material things. But there was still a hunger inside of me for truth, for realness, for reality, for real love, real friends, for the real meaning to life. And when I went to university, I went to York in my undergraduate, and we were searching every which way you can for the truth and the reality of life. And so we read all the different Voltaire, and we read Machiavelli, and we read all the Greek philosophers, and we read all the... And you know what we found? Dead ends. After dead end. After dead end. And it wasn't until February the 10th, 1980, when the Lord called me out of the world and spoke to me and said, I have created you with, with a purpose and a plan for your life. And from that day forward, we have been serving the Lord for the past, well, 40 years, praise God, eh? Now you know he, I'm an old guy. So, <laughs> But you know something? It changed my life because it filled me with the things that I hungered for, that everyone hungers for, that we cannot get, get filled with the things of this world. But you know... Where does that take us next? From the general revelation, it takes us into what's called special revelation. And who was the greatest special revelation of all? None other than Jesus Christ himself. He is the special revelation. And I say, if you want to get to know God, if you want to get to know your Savior, I'm, I'm encouraging you all this year to, starting in 2022, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Holy Spirit told me that a few years ago, and I said, Lord, I mean, I've read the Gospels, I've taught Christology, I've taught the Synoptic Gospels, I've read those. And he said, you asked me what you wanted me to do, and so I'm telling you what to do, read the Gospels. And brothers and sisters, as I read those Gospels, again, for the very first time, I learned things about Jesus I never saw before. Things about his character, his nature, the way he handled all different kinds of people. People that loved him, the people that despised him, the people who washed his feet with their tears, and the one who would betray him. How he tra dealt with all of these different individuals in their lives, and we've all got different kinds of peoples in our lives, eh? Amen. So let's turn to the scripture verse this morning. It actually comes from John 15, and it's verses 1 to 8. It says, I am the vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will, even, it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and also, also I will also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like branches that are thrown away and 
wither and such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is my, to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Holy Spirit, we invite you now to be with us as we break the bread of life. We feed our spirit person. We pray that you would help us have ears to hear what you are saying. We pray that you would have hearts to receive it and lives to live it out. We just thank you in advance for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. So what, what, what is this good fruit that Jesus is talking about? Well, one of the ways you study the Bible is you learn to interpret the Bible by the Bible. You don't go to dictionaries and you don't go to other sources. You go to the Bible to find out. So when we talk about fruit, immediately you start to think of the fruit of the Spirit that's in Galatians chapter 5. List of the fruit of the Spirit is there, verses 22 and 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It is through that kind of fruit that your family, neighbors, and friends will taste and see that the Lord is good. He said, if you bear this kind of fruit, you will be called my disciples. Not because you come to church. Not because you, you, you serve in some capacity in the church. Not because you read your Bible every day. I mean, those are all good things to do, amen? But he says, you will bear good fruit, and you will show that you're my disciple if you bear good fruit. And that is what Jesus said. And it's what's interesting about this, these verses is that Jesus repeats these words seven times. Seven times he says, remain in me, abide in me, remain in me, abide in me, remain in me, abide in me, remain in me, abide in me. Do you think it's something important? <laughs> like, come on, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I can tell Jesus nowhere else in the four Gospels does he ever say something four times. Three times, yes, and those were important things. But this one, seven times. Like, do you think we should be studying this and looking it over and taking it seriously? I think so, and that's why I preach this message wherever I go, because I think it's that important. And we need to know what this fruit of the Spirit looks like. And of course, again, we look to the Bible to give us the fruit of the Spirit and the meaning of those things. We look at love. You know, the the world's got songs, some, all kinds of songs. You know, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. But the world doesn't know what that kind of love is. It comes out of Hollywood and Harlequin, and it's all about emotions and all kinds of other feelings. What's that other? Feelings, nothing more than feelings. I know, keep my, I'll keep my, I will stay out of the, the worship team. I, that's not my thing. But we know what real love is, According to the word of God, in 1 Corinthians 13, it says love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Wow. Wow. That's God's love. And brothers and sisters, that's the kind of fruit of love that we need to bear so that our family, neighbors, and friends can taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? It's that love. Did you, did you see any emotions and in, 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 in feelings in that list? No. You know what it is? It's all action. That's like my father used to tell me. I'd say to him, I'll never do it again, Dad. And he said to me, don't tell me, show me. So let's not tell people we love them. Let's show them that we love them in real, practical, and tangible ways. You know, Jesus said, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. And he said, when do we do this, Lord? And he said, whenever you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. When we love in practical and tangible ways like that, that's when our family, neighbors, and friends can taste and see that the Lord is good. Every one of us has neighbors. We have a lot, number of elderly people in our building, and most of them are alone. Most of them have family that are far away or they never hear from. And, you know, every time we get it on and off the elevator, I say, God bless you. God bless you. And like they, their faces light up just at a simple God bless you and ways to reach out to them. And we're praying for that opportunity to do that as we 
get to be known, and it's, we come out of COVID, and you can take your mask off if you're not afraid of what, what's underneath that mask. So there's practical and tangible ways that we can demonstrate our love. Then, of course, there's God's love that never fails. It's not based on emotions. It's not based on feelings. Then there's joy. Oh, my goodness, how much do we need joy right now, eh? This has been a hard time. And the Bible says that we have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Our joy, again, is not based upon our circumstances. Our joy is based upon who we are and whose we are. Our joy comes from that. No matter what you're going through in your life, no matter what your circumstances are, the joy of the Lord is our strength, amen? And that's the kind of joy that our family, neighbors, and friends need to see in us. They need to see us bear this kind of fruit because they don't see it anywhere else. How can they taste and see if the Lord is good if we're not bearing good fruit? And then the fruit of peace. Oh, my goodness. How many households need peace? One of the things in pastoral ministry you just walk through is so many families that are literally at war with each other. Families that were broken and battered and bruised and young couples. I mean, I think the devil's just going after young couples in a special way. And I pray for you every day, young couples. You know, I was just talking with your son there. And he's talking about having two kids in diapers. And I'm going, brother, <laughs> I tried to forget about that. <laughs> but it's young couples are under attack because the family is the core of God's way of demonstrating his love in this world. And is it easy? No, it's hard work sometimes. Sometimes we got to say, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm on every guy in, in this room and, and online to repeat after me, I'm sorry. Okay, guys, come on. So you can say it with me. I'm sorry. Good. Just remember those words and you'll have a good marriage. Just every time anything happens, you say, I'm sorry. <laughs> Whether you mean it or not. The words are important. Now, you should mean it. Eventually, you'll come to mean it. Eventually, you'll come to mean it. But... Just say it, because it's so important to let not the sun go down on your wrath. Amen? So we want peace. Not anxious about the day and the life and the future. We don't have to be. We serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Peace that passes all understanding. In other words, it makes no sense. You're going through heck at work. You're going through a hard time in your family. You're going through difficulties, but you have peace because your peace is not based on your circumstances, as I already said. We need to have that kind of peace in our lives. Amen? And the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons and daughters of God. That we are to be peacemakers in our families, be peacemakers at work, be peacemakers in our neighborhood. Where sometimes there's some real challenges going on with people from different backgrounds and races and kindreds and tribes and tongues. We need to be peacemakers in our neighborhood. We need to learn to be content. Oh my goodness, there's a hard one. We, when everything around you is telling you more, 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 you need more. We need to be content with what God has given us and not be envious of other people. Not be envious of our neighbor or our brother or our sister because they got a new job or they got a new car. But we can be content with whatever we have. You know where I've learned that lesson the most? Is in my ministry in Cuba. Those people have nothing. And they are content in the Lord. They are grateful for a, ba a bowl of rice and beans and maybe a little meat. And right now, they're lining up 12 hours to get that. From 6 in the morning till 6 at night to get rice and rice and beans. And sometimes the other day I was talking to my friend in Havana. He lined up all day, and at 6 o'clock they shut the door, and he didn't get anything. Twelve hours he waited for rice. So be at peace with the circumstances. Then kindness. Kindness is selfless help in word or deed. Selfless help. That's what kindness is. You know that old anxiety, give a cup of kindness? Well, kindness is selfless help to other people. Maybe you see you've got neighbors and there's a young single mom there and she's got a couple of three small ones 
And boy, boy, you, you don't know what that's like until one time when the girls were little and Morocco went away at a conference or something and I had them for the weekend. When she came back, I raised up and called her blessed. I thought, oh my goodness, it was only four days or three days, two nights and three days, and I was just about broken, you know. And, I, and then the Holy Spirit said to me, think what it's like to be a single mom. Seven days a week, week after week, month after month. What an opportunity to show them kindness, selfless help. We can do acts of kindness. You know, I never understood the phrase that says a cup of cold water in my name until I went to Cuba and it was 50 degrees in the middle of the day and someone gave me a cup of cold water and I went, wow, that's what a cup of cold water means. And it's something as simple as that. We think things got to be big and complex. No, just some simple act of kindness. Maybe when you're shoveling your snow on your driveway, your sidewalk, there's an elderly person lives next door to you or down the street. Go and shovel their sidewalk, shovel their driveway. And then you say, say, why are you doing this? I'm doing it because this is what Jesus would want me to do. That's when they can taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? Simple acts of kindness. In, in, in Cuba, they have a thing they call it paella evangelism. How many knows what paella is? It's a, it's a big dish with rice in it, and they put, literally, it's all leftovers. It's a, whatever's left over, little fish, little meat, little this, you got to have some of those sausages in it and, and, and some saffron to turn it all yellow. And then they take that paella, and then they go in their neighbors and, hello, we want to share a paella with you. And they go, what? They've been lining up for 12 hours to get food too. And they go, why would you share the food that you waited so long to get with us? And they will say, because this is what the Jesus would have us do, to be kind to our neighbors, our families and friends. And brothers and sisters, you can preach the Bible to them till the cows come home. But an act of kindness like this, a little paella evangelism, that's what changes lives. Now they're open to your gospel. They want to know, why would you do this? Well, because Jesus changed my life. We sang the songs about how he has provided and looked after us, amen? And then we need to share it with other people. Goodness, the fruit of goodness. Do the right thing even when it costs you something. Ooh, I'm going to say that one again, eh? Do the right thing even when it costs you something. It's a special kind of goodness. I'll tell you, give you an example. When I was in business before ministry, I was had a van that we drove all over the place and we put stuff in, and, and one, I needed snow tires. So one of my customers said, well, I know where to get snow tires. And, he, and I said, that's great. I said, you know, if you can do that, I appreciate it. And he goes, well, here, here's the cash price. And he said, and, and, and I said, well, I appreciate that, but I'll render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. In other words, I'll pay the tax. I'm not going to do it under the table. And he looked at me and he goes, are you weird or something? And I said, no, no, no. Just... And I wasn't, I was doing business with this guy, so I was being very careful about my witness and how I handled it. About three months later, I get a call from him. And he says to me, Gary he said, you know, I understand that you're a Christian. I said, I am. And he goes, a lot of people say that. He said, but you know that time when you bought those tires and you paid the tax on that because that's the right thing to do? He goes, man, you put your money where your mouth is. He said, I'm sick right now. Would you come and pray for me? Do the right thing even when it costs you something. That's what spoke to that man. He was a businessman, and the money meant something. When I put my money where my mouth was, all of a sudden... His heart opened, and he said, could you come and pray with me? I'm really sick. And we did, and we thank God for that. In the Bible, it talks about going an extra mile. If someone says, you know, a Roman soldier asked you to carry their stuff, you had to do it by law for at least a mile. And what Jesus was saying was, even go an extra mile. You want your testimony to mean something? He says, not only give them your coat, but give them your cloak also. Cost you something. Goodness cost something. It's not cheap. We don't serve a God of cheap grace. Read, read Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship, and he talks about cheap 
grace. And brothers and sisters, there's a lot of cheap grace going on out there. It's not the real deal. Then there's faithfulness, going the extra mile. That's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Even when times are tough and difficult with somebody, you walk with them through the valley of the shadow of death. Literally. That's when they need us the most. And let me tell you, it's not just at the time that maybe their mother, father, sister, brother, or spouse is, is dying, but it's after. I always put it in my, well, back in the day it was called a Palm Pilot. You wouldn't even know what those are. But that was the first electronic calendar that we had, and I could program it. And in, in three months and in six months, I would contact them to see how they were doing. And many times I got this response like, God just sent you, didn't he? I go, really? No, it was really Palm Pilot, but, you know. But they needed a call from someone to encourage them. Because everybody's around at the beginning of the, the funeral and a few days and weeks after, but everybody's life goes back to normal. But in three months, six months, a year later, that's when they need that call, that gentleness. Let's look at the last fruit, because I'm going to run out of time. And to me, and this is interesting, you need to know this about how Eastern thinking was. We make a list, and we always put the number one thing at the top, right? They don't. They put the most important at the last, so you'll remember it, because that's the way the brain works. So that what do they put at the very last of the list of the fruit of the Spirit? Self-control. Ooh. How many here need a little self-control? Come on. Especially when you're driving on the highway. Come on. I was, I was coming in here to the church this morning. We need self-control. We need, but you know what? I found out I don't, I don't have any self-control. I, I, I'm being honest with you. But what I am is spirit control. I allow the Holy Spirit to come in and control, take control of my life. And I say, not my will, but thy will be done. And Holy Spirit, you got to help me. you got to help me with my mother. God bless her, 88 years old. And, oh. and you got to help me to have that spirit-controlled life, that self-control, that disciplined life that a true disciple has. That's what we need. And we can't do it in our own strength, but we can do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so we need to... Make sure that relationship with the Holy Spirit is vibrant and alive. And if you've done anything to grieve, quench culture, God forbid, blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you need to get up here afterwards and get on your knees before God and say, forgive me. I didn't mean to grieve, quench, quench the Spirit of God because I need you, Holy Spirit. Before I stand up here and deliver the Word of God, I sit there and I say, Holy Spirit, if I've done anything to grieve, quench, quench, quench you, I thank you, Jesus, for the blood, and it cleanses me, and I recognize, and if there's anything, bring it to my remembrance so I can say I, I can apologize right now because I want to stand here with clean heart, pure hands. Amen? And so we want to do that so that our family, neighbors, and friends can taste and see that the Lord is good. And what does James tell us? James tells us the most thing we've got to get under control is what? A hung. Oh, there's a whole message itself. Just on the, the tongue and what the tongue can do. It can praise God, but it can tear brothers and sisters down. You know? Be very careful what you say to your children. Make sure you say things that are going to build them up and encourage them. Amen? They don't understand why you say the things you do, but they can be hurtful and they can stick with them for a long time. Ephesians talks about them. They're called fiery darts of the wicked. Do you want to be a wicked parent that shoots fiery darts into your child's heart, into their life? No way. And if you have, you need to ask the Holy Spirit to help you pull them out. Get down on your knees and look them in the eye and say, I'm sorry for what I said to you. I was wrong. Nothing wrong with apologizing to your children. We, 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 you know, two generations ago, especially fathers, never said they were sorry. <laughs> Even though everybody knew they were wrong. I knew that my dad was wrong, my mother knew, my brother knew, the dog knew. But he, but he would, but you, you, well, men just didn't say I was wrong. It was somehow a sign of weakness or something. That's ridiculous. Weakness is when you are so prideful that you can't say it, and we need to be able to say, I'm sorry. Amen? So Jesus goes on to saying about how do I produce good fruit. First, I must be abiding in the vine. 
I must be abiding in the life source that is Jesus Christ. He is the source of our ability. Without him, we can do nothing. When I was in Cuba one time, I was there at a farm, and the, guy, the pastor was actually a horticulturalist, and he was into grafting different kinds. So he'd find a mango tree that grew up. Oh, and by the way, what is with this? You know, you go to a grocery store here, and they got mangoes that are about this big. Then I go to Cuba, and they got mangoes that are this big. I said, I thought you liked us Canadians. They said, oh, yeah, we do, we do. I said, well, how come we got these the Chiquita mangoes in Canada, and in Cuba they got these great big mangoes. I said, you keep the big ones for yourselves and ship up the little tiny mangoes to us. So, you know, don't tell me that those things are mangoes in our stores. Not when I've seen them like that, eh? And they are amazing. Who want you know that it wasn't an apple on the tree in the garden? It was a mango. Come on. I mean, nothing tastes better than a mango, and the juice runs down your face. And they put it. They put the mango fruit in a in, a, in, in some ice in a blender, and they. Zzz, Oh, my goodness, ambrosia. You know, you think, okay, it might be 50 degrees out, but I can live with this. So we must abide in him. We must be grafted into him. And so what this horticulturalist did, in order, because some trees are really strong in their roots and in their trunk and their branches, but they produce chiquita mangoes, eh? So he would find the mango tree that produced the big mangoes, and he would take a branch off of it, and he would shave it down, and then he would take his machete out, and he would whack the other mango in the branch and put a big gash into it deep enough that it went right down to the core where all the sap and everything, the life was flowing, and he would stick it in there, and then he would take and he would wrap like a gunny sack or wrap around it and around it and around and then he poured wax over the whole thing. And then he came and he said, here's what I did about three months ago, and he broke the wax off and took off the binding, and there was that branch living in that other, that vine living in that branch. It got its life. And you know what the Holy Spirit says to me? That's how deep into Jesus you need to go. If you want to produce good fruit, you need to be that deep into Jesus. And brothers and sisters, the only way you're going to get that deep into Jesus is in this book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. By reading the scriptures and coming to a place where you know your position and your place with Jesus, you are deep into him. That you know he's not just your savior. Everybody wants their fire insurance, right? You know, from hell, right? Oh, yeah, I want that. But it's another thing to make him Lord of your life. That's a whole other thing. And that's what he's talking about here. Jesus says, if you want to abide in me, if you abide in me deep enough, if you are truly abiding in me, you will produce good fruit, and then you will be called my disciples. Ooh. So abiding does a lot of things. It protects that branch from disease, insects, vermin, doubt, fear. Protects us from, promotes growth. It produces good fruit. So how do I abide and remain? Well, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, he says, if my word remains in you. Remain means to stay there. So many of us, we're in with the Lord, we're out. We're up, we're down. It says remain there, remain there. His word, he said, if my word remains in you. So how, does we, how do we have it that the word of God remains in us? By spending time in it. You know, I got saved on February the 10th, 1980. I was living in number two of Cinnaboyne, apartment 404 at York University in the graduate residence. And let me just tell you this too. I went through elementary school, high school, and university and never met a Christian. Never met a Christian. No one ever told me that Jesus loved me. No one ever told me. And there I was at York, tentanda via, the way must be tried, searching in all the ways but the wrong ways. Don't let that be said of you, Champion Life, that your family, neighbors, and friends, and co-workers, or whoever you're connected with, don't know. It doesn't mean going and shoving the Bible down their throat. It means bearing good fruit so that they can taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? So how do we remain in his word? We read it, we listen to it, we study it. 
His word, in his word, it is him. You got to understand, all other books are books. This is not just a book. This is a physical manifestation of God himself. Just as the burning bush was, just as the other examples in the Bible of manifestations of God, this is it for us. This is where it says in John, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word became flesh. We, when we read this book, when we make it part of our life, this changes us. Why do you think the devil and your flesh, your fallen nature, doesn't want you reading this book? Well, I was going to read, but oh, t- oh, you're tired now. Your flesh is going to your spirit. You're tired now. It's, t- it's, too, it's, it's too early in the morning. It's too late at night. All kinds of excuses not to read this book. But let me tell you, if you knew that you were going to die if you didn't read it, you'd be reading it. And let me tell you, if you don't read that book, you will die spiritually. And you will not remain in him. Become part of a Bible study. I know that's one thing. And that's what's built Champion Life over the years is, is a small groups. And, that, and that's what connected us in the beginning because of we were both reading Brother Cho's book on small groups. And it was one of the very, very first books. And we were the first few pastors that were doing. I was doing it at Messiah Gospel Temple. And, and Jerry was doing it at Jesus First. And we connected and Went, wow, you know, because this is the way you got to get people into it. You can't expect them to do it on their own all the time. We need each other. Amen? We need each other. Then we want to memorize the scripture. It says, I will memorize and I will meditate upon your word, O God, so that I will not sin against you. You need to memorize scripture. For, and here's my favorite. This got me through all my education. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. And whenever I would feel the spirit of fear coming upon me when I was studying or writing an exam or whatever I was doing, I would start to say that verse. I would mutter it. That's what meditate means, to mutter. You know, the Eastern mysticists, they mutter some ramadamadam, ding dong. And we, mem- we, mem- we memorize and we meditate on the word of God. Okay? So we memorize and we meditate upon the word of God. Another way to remain in him is in prayer. Prayer is an important part of our relationship. And prayer is not just getting there with your list of all the things that, you know, you want uh, from God to do for you. Sometimes you've got to sit there and listen and wait for God to speak to you. Amen? And if you've got the word hidden in your heart, that's just how he'll start to speak to you. It's through his word he'll start bringing scripture verses to your remembrance. You're going, where's that coming from? That's the Holy Spirit bringing that scripture to your remembrance so that you can remain in him. We remain in him in service. Talked about that already as part of the fruit, how we serve the Lord in various capacities. You know, it doesn't matter what age or stage you're at. I remember my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, she was in her 80s. And she's going to the senior's home to push the library cart and, and, and the tea cart around the, the old folks' home. I said, Grandma, you're older than most of these people here. She goes, oh, dear, but they're not well. You know, <laughs> 80 years old, and she's still pushing the tea cart and the library cart around the senior's home. Come on. No matter what age or stage you're at, and it doesn't matter if you're bedridden, you can get in and you can pray, pray, pray. You can serve his kingdom. We remain in him in worship. How wonderful the opportunity to worship here on Sunday morning. But you know what? We can worship him throughout the week. You know? You got to commute your doom, put your buds on, turn up some worship music, and boy, and all of a sudden, I mean, I've had it sometimes, I've had the thing going in my car, I start to weep, I got to pull off the road because I can't drive because <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord has come upon me and I can't drive anymore. I got to pull over. And here's, a, here's another one. That sometimes we take this stuff for granted. We don't see it as abiding or things like that. It's fellowship. Brothers and sisters, we need each other. I need you and you need me. Pastor Jerry has been such an encouragement to me in my ministry over the years. We need each other. There are no lone rangers. There's no lone rangers. We need each other. We need the accountability. Oops. Accountability? Come on. I'm accountable to God. No, we're accountable to each other. 
And we remain in him when we are connected to each other. Then he says in it, he, verse 2, he said, He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. My grandfather had an orchard on his farm where I spent a lot of my younger life loving it. I didn't, I didn't have to read Tom Sawyer. I lived Tom Sawyer. <laughs> But anyway, in, in, in the fall, he would go out there with his pruning hook and that, and he would start to hack away branches off of these trees. Like sometimes they were almost like they were like a nub. And I'm going, Grandpa, you're going to kill the trees? He goes, no. He goes, this is how they're going to produce bigger and better fruit next year. And sure enough, he was right every year. That, and they were low enough that you could pick them. He didn't, they weren't 30 feet high, producing nitty-bitty plums like that. They were about 10 feet high, and they were producing plums like that. And so pruning was critical to producing good fruit. And a lot of these things that Jesus is talking about are in these agricultural terms because that's what people understand. And so he said, are you willing? Are you willing to let go of things? Are you willing to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you, to change things in your life, to prune the dead wood? Now you say, okay, what's the dead wood? Well, let's go back to the scriptures. Again, in Galatians, it says, these are the fruit of the Spirit, but these are the works of the flesh. Sexual, immoral, immoral, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Hmm. Now, immediately everybody's going, well, I don't know, debauchery and or, orgies and all that sort of stuff. You know the two things that God hates the most in the Bible, if you read it over and over and over and over again in the Bible, he hates liars and he hates gossipers. And they're mutual, and gossip will kill a church, kill a fellowship, kill people faster than anything else. Gossiping, talking about somebody behind their back. If you haven't got the guts to say it to their face and shut your mouth, gossip. You know, these are the kinds of things that God wants us to prune out of our lives, but we can't do it on our own. We need to say, Holy Spirit, you got to help me. You gotta help me overcome these things. You gotta help me shut my mouth, bite my tongue. Like my father used to say, he said, Gary, you don't have to say everything that comes into your mind. You know? Just you can think about it, but you don't have to say it. So there's those external things. You know, I remember at a certain point in my early walk with the Lord, I said, Well, Lord, I don't spit, smoke, swear, or chew, or hang out with those that do anymore. You know what the Holy Spirit said to me? He said to me, Gary, that's the obvious stuff. Like that list in, in, in Galatians 5, that's pretty obvious, most of that stuff. You know what he said to me? Now I'm going to deal with the intents of your heart. The intents, the intentions, that are, the things that are in your heart. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, and on and on and on. He says, the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the vain imaginations. It's those things that are in my heart that will come out. And so we've been working on changing my heart for the past 40 years. And we're still working on it. Just ask my wife. <laughs> that's, that's another point. If you ever want to know what's going on, what's really going on in your life, just ask your spouse. They'd be happy to tell you. You know, they're, they're no problem, for, especially us guys, you know, because we think, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, just ask your wife, how am I doing? Have I got love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, forbearance, mercy, and self-control in my life? Hmm. Going to need some extra classes in marital. <laughs> so there's a pruning out of all those obviously not good things. Amen? But then the Holy Spirit said, you know what? There's some good things I want you to prune too. They're not bad. You know, what's the one thing if you say to people, you know, could you help me with this? Could you do that? What do they say immediately? I'm too busy. Oh, my goodness. I'm too busy. Too busy to serve my neighbor. I'm too busy to love. Too busy to serve the church. Too busy, too busy, too busy. What are we too busy doing? Well, I, I happen to look it up. You want to know something? Ask Google. Google will tell you what we're too busy doing. We're on the Internet. We're watching TV. We're into get video games. We're into hobbies, we're into football, and you know what? Here's another one, don't, don't, bite, don't, don't yell at me for this one. Sometimes we're too busy doing church stuff. Your family, neighbors, and friends don't even know you 
because you're too busy at the church because you never spend any time with your family, neighbors, and friends. You can be too busy doing that, and that's not good either. So sometimes the Lord will say, you know what? I want you to give up. Let's fast the internet for a month. (gasps) He didn't really say that, did he? Well, he didn't mean it. No. You know, I'm off of social media. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just slowly, and I'm, the last one is LinkedIn. And, I, and I'll tell you what, what put it for me was, all I did is I went into our, our, my Facebook, my family Facebook page, and I put on that picture that you saw up there because we added Michael to the family. Next thing you know, I got 186 somebody's, and I don't even know who these people are. And I said, that's it. I don't have 186 friends anywhere. I mean, if I got four or five friends, I'm lucky. Jerry, you're one of them, so... I'll, I'll, I'll keep you, I'll keep you. But for the rest of them, forget it. So we got to learn how to even prune good things to make time for our family and ears. Make time that we can abide and remain in his word, that we can produce good fruits. Amen? So that's how do we prune? Well, step one is we need to recognize that we, our need for change that there are areas of our lives that sometimes are a little out of control, the bad stuff and the good stuff. Step two is recognizing that only God can change us. We can't change ourselves. We need the help of the Holy Spirit with everything. If we believe that we can change ourselves, then we, are, we deceive ourselves, and we have not the truth of God in us. That's what the Bible says. We're self-deceived if we think we can do it on our own. Holy Spirit, Come. We need to have a willingness and a desire to change. We need to say, I need to change. I need to be producing and bearing good fruit. So obviously, there's some things I need to prune out of my life. You need to be willing to do it. So we have to ask ourselves this morning, what kind of fruit am I growing in my life? Am I growing the big mangoes of love, joy, and peace, or am I growing those itty-bitty ones? And sometimes those itty-bitty ones are sour. They don't taste real good. What kind of fruit am I producing in my life? Is it good fruit where my family, neighbors, and friends can taste and see that the Lord is good? And when they encounter me, if they feed themselves on the love, joy, peace, long-suffering, forbearance, kindness, mercy, and control fruit that we're producing in our lives? Or is it bitter and sour and oof? Or is it like my grandmother... Oh, don't jump to my grandmother. She had this bowl of fruit on the table. Absolutely perfect stuff. I mean, the banana was yellow and the apple was red and the pear was green. And as a little kid, I remember looking at it going, oh, man, that's a, I've never seen fruit like that. And when I crawled up onto the table and I picked it up and I bit into it, and guess what? It was wax. It was <laughs> wax. It was a fake. My grandmother put fake fruit on the table. How could she? But brothers and sisters, sometimes we produce fake fruit. We say we love. We say we have joy and gentleness and kindness and mercy. But it ain't real. Because you can only produce the real thing if you abide in him and you remain in Jesus. Amen? So today... Last slide, I kind of got lost with the slides, but the last slide asks these three questions. It says, first of all, am I grafted into Christ? In other words, have I made Jesus Savior of my life? Have I made him my all in all? Am I feeding off of the life that Christ has for each and every one of us? Am I grafted into Christ? Am I born again? The next one is, is am 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 I abiding in him? In other words, am I remaining in him? Am I remaining in his word? And am I keeping that in the forefront of my life so that I'm feeding every single day and he is feeding my spirit and keeping me alive so that I can produce good fruit? The final question is, is maybe do I need some pruning? Maybe there's some Galatians 5 stuff. Maybe we've got some envy and bitterness. Maybe we've got resentments. Maybe we've got a little gossip going on. Maybe we're telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And the Holy Spirit's saying, come on, I want you to let go of that. I'll help you. You don't have to do it on your own. And maybe there's some good things that he wants to prune 
too much TV, too much internet, too much of the other stuff. Spend time in his word. Spend time with your children. Spend time with your spouse. When was the last time you took your wife out on a date? There's a novel idea. My wife on a date? You know? Come on. There's, there's important things that we need to spend time doing and a little less time doing other stuff that seems to be good. You know? So, we close this morning with this prayer. Let's bow our heads and thank the Lord. Lord, this morning we come before you in Jesus' name. And if there are those out there here in the Scottatorium or online watching us all over the world, and they have not made Jesus Savior and Lord of their life, that they're not abiding in him, that they're not grafted into him, this morning is opportunity for them to do that. Say, Jesus, I want to live my life for you. I want to live my life with you. And Holy Spirit, we just pray you would respond to them. And as they let you prune them of all the bad stuff that's gone on, as you cleanse them and help them, that they can then begin to abide in Jesus, abide in his word, and the word will remain in them. And there are those of us, Lord, who need to abide, who need to remain, not just a little here and a little there, but all the time abiding and remaining and remaining and abiding, just as Jesus said seven times in this passage. Finally, Lord, if there's things in our lives, areas of our lives that need pruning, we ask you, Holy Spirit, to bring it to our remembrance, to show us the things that we need to prune. And Lord, most of the time it starts with our tongues. We need to prune the tongue and speak the words of life. We just thank you, Holy Spirit, for your help in identifying those things. Help us to be willing to let them be pruned, let them be taken out of our lives so that we can produce good fruit so that our family, neighbors, and friends can taste and see that the Lord is good. And all God's people said, amen.